Hi, I'm Russ Kamarna, an independent filmmaker and actor in New York, and in between the chances I get to do my creative projects, I love to sit down and talk with other artists to see how it is they do what they do, how they take art and use their craft to reveal truth to an audience. So in this series of conversations, you'll meet some people you may recognize, some people you won't recognize, but they're all independent artists and we'll get in depth in a long form conversation to see how it is they do what they do. Welcome to Art Craft Truth. This time around on Art Craft Truth, casting director and coach Brett Goldstein. Brett has been a casting director and coach for over 20 years, casting hundreds of plays, 300 plus television commercials, five television series, among countless independent films that have won awards at film festivals all over the world. Now, she spent a life casting actors into specific characters, but as you'll see in this conversation, she's quite a character herself, and she's going to show us a part of the business we don't often look at, the casting room and what it takes to get that job. Brett Goldstein. All right, so let me let me roll all this stuff so that we're going. Right. All right, so Brett, welcome, welcome, welcome aboard. Thank you so much for for doing this. So you come from our, our another uh, I'm a blessed angel, uh, Kate Van Devender recommendation. Um, uh, first of all, how, where do you, where do I get you from? How do you know Kate? What's the, what's that all about? We met here in New York. Probably, I don't know, it was probably close to 20 years ago. And we probably met before a friend of ours got married um, for the first time. And this was a fucked up wedding that I had like PTSD from for years because we were all given so many responsibilities. I just kept going in there being like, this is fucked up. And (laughs) she was so nice and kind about it. And she would just sit there and be like, oh, no, I'm happy. And I was like, yeah, you're not. Yeah. This is goddamn misery. And I would walk out and like put sand and candle bags and stuff like that. So that's how being a bitch, me being a bitch. But Kate, we, Kate we always being an angel. I mean, that's what, that's, that, that's her thing. She's a magnet that way. So, uh, so that. talk, yes. and I'm talking to you today from New York, right? You're yeah. in, you're in the city. Yeah. Now, have you always been based in New York? As of 2000, As before of 2000. that I was in D.C. D.C., right. Okay. All right. So let's, let's start. You're a, you're a casting director, but you're also, uh, I guess, what would you call a performance coach? What, what, what would be the other title that you're... Yeah, I mean, thank you for, for saying that because that's actually kind of new to me. I, I was doing a lot of coaching and teach. I, I am doing a lot of coaching and teaching for actors. What I realized, what I discovered over the past few years is I love that aspect of it even mm. more than the casting. Right. Um, also because it doesn't come with producers and all that, that Michigas. So I love, and I love actors. So one of the things that I loved most, love most about working with actors is being able to say, this is the thing about you that pops, that's sparkly, your right. it factor, you know, what makes you a sexy motherfucker, <laughs> whatever it is. That's what I love. And I got the opportunity, I mean, it's a long story, not even worth telling, but like a few years ago for a big pharmaceutical company, they asked me to come in and do presentation coaching. And what I realized is for like, you know, the real people, like people in the real world, they don't have that experience. Like even for actors, they don't get it enough, but at least they get a little bit of it from feedback and acting class or castings or things like that. But in the real world, no one says, this is what makes you a a person I'd want to watch on my TV or listen to on a podcast or whatever. So to be able to do that and offer it quickly and from a casting director's perspective, was eye-opening and super fun for them. And I had the best week of my life, and I was like, more, please. So okay. today I've launched a new website, and I'm psyched. That's so great. So th- th- today, this very day, you started, you put it up on- online and put it out there for the for the public to, to consume. So we're going to get, we're going to circle back around to that. Um, uh, I want to get into the, the whole casting and all that stuff first, but um, let's get into your background. Where, where are you from originally? I was born on the Jersey Shore, Moved to Maryland by the age of eight, was like a Maryland person, went to University of Maryland, probably just because I was too lazy to apply anywhere else, and then stayed in the D.C. area, uh, did a lot of great casting there for small theaters, and ended up getting a great gig at the Folger at a very, very, very young age that lasted for nine seasons, so I did a lot of Shakespeare, but I also, I knew the whole time that it didn't feel like home. And, you know, I'm like a typical New York Jew. My whole family, (laughs) most of my family lived here and moved to Boston, but they were New Yorkers. So I knew I'd live here eventually, and I moved here 20 years ago. So when you were a kid, did you want to get into showbiz? Did you want to be a performer? Like, what I find interesting about, uh, because your craft, 
uh, specifically talk about casting directors, it's very interesting because people usually come at it from like all different angles. Some people were secretaries who were doing script coverage. Some people who were actors, some people were direct, like they, they, it's not like this sort of direct path to be, I want to be a casting director. How did you, what was your dream as a kid and how did you get into that end of it? I remember, okay. The dream as a kid was to be an actor, but I don't, know if I necessarily had a vision of what that was. Mm. I just thought like that seemed like a good idea. But my parents, interestingly, who are both Juilliard graduates, uh, music, okay, were like, oh, oh, hell no. Like yeah. you're like the Ashkenazi, like even my, in my generation, it's you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a right. lawyer. Like it, there's no actor thing. Uh, okay. In fact, they said like, we will not contribute in any way financially if you decide to be a theater major. Wow. And they and were, I, and they were musicians. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, and even with that, like my mom, may she rest in peace, like made my dad sell the bassoon to pay the mortgage. Like when he was in his mid twenties, I mean, like she didn't trust like two musicians in a household. Right. And that was actually unfortunate because he was really good and was already playing in pit orchestras for Broadway and it was probably union at that point. Like it was, you know, but, but I think that they were, she was scared. Yeah. So no acting. Okay. I got, when I got into college, I, I was a theater major you and go I to think school? I wanted to be an actor. Where'd you go to school? University of Maryland college oh, right, park, right, okay. which at the time was, um, not a, not an amazing program. Uh, not even great. I would say I'm being careful because I actually am really close friends with one of my professors <laughs> and we just spoke yesterday. So Scott, sorry about that. But at the time it wasn't awesome. You were new or actually weren't even there for, for some of the time I was there. And I also, like, I was kind of like, why am I leaning in? Like I'm whispering to you, Jesus Christ. I'm like, <laughs> I, I was kind of like, all right, you. do I want to eat low main right. or act? Right. Like, cause I kind of feel like a Bette Midler type. This doesn't work at, as a, as a 19 year old. Do I, what do I, and I chose eating. And so I, I knew <laughs> I loved acting. I loved the people, but I also had to work part-time jobs cause mom and dad sure. weren't involved in the thing. So I couldn't do any of the shows, just something felt wrong, but no one knew about the casting thing or, I mean, right. Yeah. No, I mean, it's yeah. not something you would like, I would lean into or as a young actor to think, well, there's something I can do. Um, so as a, as a young person, when you're thinking about acting, what was the kind of stuff that turned you on where, I mean, clearly you got, you got plenty of New York stick, which we love. So were you a, did you love uh, comedy stuff? Were you a Neil Simon type of person? Were you a musical theater person? Like, what was the kind of things that you wanted to do, or did it matter? When I was a kid kid, yeah. I loved musical theater okay. stuff. So, like, I played, like, Miss Adelaide several times, <laughs> you know? And then I guess I, like, got fat when I was probably 15. And at that point, I mean, what... Yeah. I mean, I guess it was... I Like, I, I hung on for as long as I can with the musical theater thing. Then when I got into college... I didn't really do much and I don't think I thought about it much. I think I was probably just high. <laughs> like I was high. I was hanging out with my friends. I like, I don't know what I wanted at that point, right. but I knew acting was going to be the thing and probably comedy. Yeah. I'm right. sure like I probably wanted Bette Midler's career. Sure. Sure. And where, and so where did, where does the transition happen then? Where do you, where do you, where does the casting come into your life and, and you go, I can do this or I'm going to do it. Or I'm going to try it. Or were you an assistant or how did that work? Oh, this is a good story. Okay. So I, I guess I kind of realized by the time I was a senior or a super senior or whatever in college, the acting thing is probably not going to happen. Like, and I, and I, I understood that from a casting perspective in the nineties, but also like we had no internet. Mm. We actually had a few people that came from professional acting backgrounds and no one talked about any of the other jobs other than like you, you were either on a design track or an acting track. So mm. we really didn't have any support, but I also wasn't asking any of the right questions. I just, I knew there was something else. And one day I had like a mini intervention, this girl, Phaedra Henley, we were sitting in costume history class and it was like the one of three times I showed up that semester, but we had to get like a decent grade to graduate in that class. I had to get like a C or above. And, um, so I showed up towards the end of the semester and she looked at me and she shook her head and she said, you know, you're a waste of a big Jewish brain. It's so sad. You're very sad to me. And I was like, okay, go on. And she said, 
you just you're a party girl and I don't understand why you're not thinking about your future but I have a suggestion the Source Theater Company is offering summer internships for the Washington Theater Festival. They produce over 100 plays in one month. You should apply. And I was like, I'll never get in. And she's like, just, just try it. Try it. I've done it. It's great. So I, I applied. I got in. I was miserable because I stuck my fat ass in like a light booth, like with a bunch of rats. I was like, you know, I, I was doing all of these production-oriented sure. jobs, but it's also DC. It's August. I'm pissed off. I'm happy I'm doing it. I'm feeling useful, but it's also really hard work. And at one point, I see this woman, probably my age now, probably like mid-40s, sitting at a desk. She's sitting the whole time, and the back of her hair is like blowing because she's got an air conditioning vent. Pointing right towards her, and I'm like, oh, this bitch. And then she's <laughs> eating Chinese food all day. She's on the phone, which I love, all day long. And once in a while, really hot people would walk down the hall and give her alcohol and food <laughs> and then kind of giggle with her for a little while and walk away. And I watched her for a few weeks. And then I asked the two people that were closer to my age that worked full time. It was the PR guy, and the development woman. Who's that woman? What does she do? And I want a piece of it. And they were like, that's Karen Berman. She's the casting director. She's casting next season. You are not to talk to her. You have nothing to do with her. We need you for the festival. And I bitched and moaned until they let me have one day with her. One day. And at the end of that day, I was like, I'm going to have your job in six months. Wow. But see, like, single white female had just come out of <laughs> <laughs> And she was like terrified because it was like concrete stairs leading up to the administration <laughs> office and probably saw the murder in my right. eyes. And uh, and she was like, okay, good luck with that. But in six months, she got a job offer, a, a job offer to teach full time at Georgetown. Wow. So and there it is. I got her job. So, all right. So, so here we go. I always look for a little theme somewhere, a little story running. Number one, Chinese food. That's that's a big theme. We started with lo mein, and once you saw the casting director eating Chinese food, you knew you were in. That's that's one th something we've got to dig into. But <laughs> but beyond that, in that day, what was it that you saw? What was she doing, and what were you looking at where you were like, fuck, that's it. That's it. I don't even... Well, I don't even think I got the good stuff, to be mm. honest with you. Like, I don't think I, I, I don't even remember the day. I, I mean, I don't, we def, I would have remembered it if we had had auditions, but we didn't. Right. I think it was just prepping. And, but what it involved was looking at headshots, mm. making, like writing things down in an organized way, which appeals to like my OCD-ness, <laughs> um, talking on the phone, which I loved. Like I could talk on the phone 24 hours a day if I didn't need sleep and still love it. And wow. like, that's. You know, that was what, because it was no, we weren't emailing people. Right, right, sure. And the not getting up, <laughs> unless you needed to pee, like there was no <laughs> running around. And yeah, I, it felt like, like, so I would call people on her behalf. I think I remember that part, like setting up auditions. Sure. And everyone was super nice and they sounded hot. <laughs> and I was like, this is this is exactly what it looked like from sitting across the room from her and staring at her creepily. So yeah, like I, the wow. prep even was great for me. And even now I like prepping. Right. So it's the, it's this, it's this kind of interaction with, with all these different kinds of people and what you can connect them to. That's the turn on. It's, it's like, uh, I'm opening a door and, I, and I'm the door. Like, I can, I'm hearing you and you know what I mean? So that, so that's the interesting, that's very interesting. And, and, um, so what's the first project that you worked on where you get an audition day where, where now you're starting to see people coming in and you're, you're doing the job either with her or, or on your own, whatever the first one was, what was that like? That first casting session? I'm trying to remember, was it the cherry orchard? Was it, I don't remember. It's funny. I don't remember the first play hmm. and I don't, think i did it with her i okay. think i was on my own oh wow okay oh my god they were very adorable too but I, mean, I would have done i would have pulled this shit too but they were basically like oh yeah all that money and the benefits but yeah we had to cut that from the budget so because i was like 23 sure. so i worked there full time but i also had to wait tables every night because right. like i was making no money um, and definitely no benefits but right. she was probably like i'm 47 now she was probably my age i'm sure she was right. fine she right. had kids 
So, or, you know, whatever, small theater, fine. I don't remember the first job, but I'm pretty sure the first director I worked with was a guy named Joe Bano. Okay. And he would, like sometimes during auditions make his ass cheeks talk like his butt was like a separate <laughs> character in the room the butt had an opinion this is like it was all fine in the right. 90s right. you know it was sure. no big deal um sometimes he'd go into the bathroom and stay in there for like 50 <laughs> minutes an hour just combing his jesus like hair and staring in the mirror like he was amazing and a character and so i feel like yeah i I knew I didn't know shit and I was really young. And But of course, when you're 23, you're a cocky little fucker right, anyway. Right. So, I, but it was him. It was like the two of, I had finally found like the guy that right. we were a perfect match. Right. So, so this is the theater. Okay. You, you eventually were going to get onto you casting for television and film and all that kind of stuff. Um, was it, is it different? Is it a different, kind of process uh for all the different mediums or 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 what you know what's the i mean obviously the actors are, are different usually and they're different kind they're different animals in uh, in different mediums but is the casting different when you're working directly with a theater director like that yeah yeah and i don't know about that anymore no. you know what about what you just said about the the actors being different animals no. because especially now not it's like the same people i mean because even nowadays well i'm an old guy so i remember you know new york being one way and la being another way and that kind of thing so but also the think about the people that are like Kristen chenoweth or norbert leo butts sure. like the people that basically help to remove the stigma right from the musical theater right right thing like that's huge yeah so and now everyone wants in on the film and television thing for sure. And the theater training, I mean, sometimes it helps, sometimes it hurts. Right, right. You know, sometimes people just have an awareness around it. But for me in my world, I like, especially because I come from a big theater background, right. I like, I just remember, oh my God, I was casting, I, well, okay, I, I, won't, I, I don't want to get in trouble, so I'm not going to get into the details, <laughs> but I will say I was casting a show for a network and Danny Burstein was up for a role and the casting directors at the network like freaked out in like the best way. Hmm. They were like, oh my God, you know, and I was like, yeah, fuck. Like they really appreciate that Danny Burstein is Danny Burstein. And like, yeah, you can do film and television, but he's like a theater actor right. and they want him so bad. And cause you could tell like, just like what you were saying right. about like our age thing is that like, they're also used to a time where there's a, right. you know, like the, these guys wouldn't get the attention they deserved. And, it, and they were like really crushed when he didn't, the role they actually cut the whole role because right. there was so much fighting about it so well, what i find interesting you know just over the course of time i not that there always was a real emphasis but the, but if you had a theater background or you were a trained actor you know there's there's stuff that you bring that you that you brought to these things that just had a little more gravity to it than you know the person who just was a personality who could get up and do something and, and, and hope they could learn eventually, you know, like, like the old studio system or something where they just were typing, you know, uh, but, but an actor, but now it's, it's a little different. So I think, I wonder if that's why I'm curious what you think about this. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if that's why you see so many uh, British Australian, you know, I mean, because there is, there's still emphasis on, on training and, and apprenticeship and, and working your craft so that when they come here, they got a toolbox of stuff, you know, is that what it is? Chops. They just yeah. have chops. Yeah. And, and I think there's, there's something missing in our American folks, you know, uh, uh that we got to get back to, we got to find those theater actors to get back out there and, and, uh, and, and with actual training. I think also there's a lot of, I mean, I don't know about a lot, but I think there are some smart casting directors out in LA that really get excited by, you know, actors that have great theater credits that are moving out there. And I think that they appreciate that. And they, I, you know, I really do think there's a lot of smart ones out in LA. You asked about the process though. I'll yeah. tell you the biggest difference, the directors okay. night and day. Okay. So, so theater director versus a uh, film or television director. What's the, what's the collaboration process difference? What is it like? night and day like with theater first of all for better or worse these directors will sit there and monologue i don't know what like sometimes they're like fuck me was there an adjustment because <laughs> you just talked for 15 minutes but if you think about it they want 
to have a four week rehearsal process sure. or more. Sure. Like that's what they want to do. Like they sign on. I don't even understand. Like I, I did direct once. It was a few years ago. I said, no, 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 no. And they were like, it's for charity. And it was like a 10 minute play. And I was like, what, what am I even supposed to do? Like, I don't, really know how to block i cast the right people <laughs> like they don't really need acting adjustments i just cast the right people like what am i doing here <laughs> i can i can adjust in the room but i direct the thing now right. so um yeah like they the way that directors also a lot of theater directors are really cognizant of how to talk to actors and they speak in actors right. language i don't know if they're trained to do that or if they came from an acting background or again they have four weeks so they there's a right way of doing right. things they're not going to sit there and give line readings i mean some of them do but for the most part this is like a thing that is so director centric one of the reasons why i got out of theater is because in theater casting it's my job to be mute in fact i've gotten in trouble hmm. aaron posner got very mad at me and he was right to do so and i learned when we were casting at the Folger, he caught on, and it was after a while, but he got, it got to the point where he looked at me and he was like, it's like these actors are like psychic. They're coming in the room and they know exactly what I want to see. And he's like, I'm starting to figure out, you're running a game. I was like, fuck, what do you mean? And he was like, I know what's happening while I'm sitting here and I'm waiting for you to come in with the actor. You're not just saying hi and hugging them and being slutty. You are going out to the waiting room and telling them exactly what I want. And I said, yeah, no, totally. I'll cop to that. What, what, what's wrong with that? Right. And you're getting what you want. And he was like, because I don't know if they can, if that's their instinct. I don't know if they can take my adjustment. He's like, you're fucking it up completely. Wow. And I was I got really upset. I didn't realize I was doing a bad thing. Interesting. Yeah. So he, I mean, I learned a lot and I never pulled that again. But okay, in the, in the theater casting situations, I have to be seen, not heard. Okay. Now. I realized when I started doing independent film, these guys don't know how to direct. Right. They're, they're, most of them are coming from a film school background or they're cinema people. And it's, it's not an actor centric uh, world they come from. So no, no one teaches them how to speak in action verbs. Like no, they have no idea. They're also introverted. Right. They're visual people. They're also super hot. Like I enjoyed <laughs> my early thirties. I was just like, okay, these directors are straight. They're hot. They're younger. They're like my age or younger. They're fun, but they're quiet. They're like the perfect little pets. Probably and like probably like Chinese food is my guess. You know, that's yeah. eating a lot of lo mein. <laughs> Taste, yeah, tasty little motherfuckers. So like, I had it, it was great. I was like, oh my god, these are like the guys I want to hang out with, and. They love it when I work with the actors. They don't want to do that shit. Right, right. So I could do it right in front of their faces. And they were like, cool. I don't, great. Right. And I've noticed that across the board, whether, whether it's film, theater, com I, okay, even in commercials now, even in callbacks, directors don't want to direct. Like they will right. sit in front of the agency folks. And for some reason, they don't give a shit that I'm directing the entire thing. They're asking for it. They just sit there quietly. Right, right. Sometimes they're not even on camera. Well, that makes, I mean, it's interesting. I've never heard, I'm glad that we get to talk because I've never seen it from that perspective, but that makes total sense. Yeah. In the theater world, it's, I mean, it's the, the, the director's really guiding that story and fucking most of them are probably teaching on Monday night somewhere anyway. So they want to hear themselves talk and, and instruct and, and pull out and work and twist where in the, the film and television stuff, they're either, if they're in film, they're, they're cinema guys who are visual guys more than anything or girls and don't really speak the actor's language and, and are hoping you're bringing the right people to it. And commercials, they're just, they're manning a giant battleship and they're more concerned with steering the wheel than, you know, so that, that's really interesting. So the role of casting director um, especially in in film and television now, the way you've delineated it. I mean, it's 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 like the the cinematographer or the editor. You know that that director is is relying on you, for the most part, to say, "Bring me the ideas. I'll eventually make a decision here." But you you cast this thing. You you bring me the the people you think are right for these parts. Um, I think that's underappreciated, you know, what, what you guys actually do uh, and, and the value of what that is, especially in film and television. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, no, I think it's, I, I really do. I, I mean, I know there was a, 
There was a documentary a while back about uh, Marion Doherty, who was one of the first big casting directors, and uh, and how the Directors Guild doesn't want to give you guys the di- casting director title, and they don't want to give directors a photographer, they want to call them cinematographers, because there's only one director, all this kind of stuff, and how there's no Oscar for casting, which is odd. But when you think about it, you know, there's there's a costume designer, there's a set designer, a production designer, a cinematographer. All these people bring incredible artistic choices to the table. Director eventually goes, well, I don't want that wall there. I don't want that shoe or whatever. And this casting is the same thing. But initially what you're doing is just as important. You're, you're making very important choices. Um, at what point do you realize that that's what, you're, that's, that's what you're doing, especially once you get out of the theater and you start to do the more independent film stuff, when you can, when you can do that stuff, when they're relying on you to do it? Like, when do you start to see that happening for you? And, and, are, and do you enjoy it? Do you immediately go, this is, I like this. I like doing this. Or I was already loving it at that point. And, and I think that it just, with theater, I would get, okay, it wasn't actually until I moved to New York and I was working, I worked for three different casting directors. Um, this is when laptops like were ha- just started happening. Right. And it was so, or at least in our world. And it was funny. We were renting a laptop in our <laughs> office. And I think that like the casting directors thought it was like a fad that was going to disappear. And there were like 50 pounds and I would have to carry it. And I got 10 minutes a day online and to plug in the fax machine. Um, and, and then, you know, it's so basically what I would see is, these directors on their laptops clicking away while the actors were in the room. And for them, it was a new toy Mm. and they were just rude because if they didn't see Juilliard, NYU, Yale, UCSD, UC Irvine, they were like, fuck you. They didn't even look up. They would look at the resume and they they didn't see what they wanted. They wouldn't even look up. Or they were just basically monologue in like a masturbatory way and I was starting to get really annoyed and they were also really bitter like they weren't directing on Broadway so they were just just, they just seemed angry right right and they were much older than I was and I was like this is not as fun as it used to be then when I went independent I was casting independent films and all of a sudden and then I was directing more in the room and I was like this is even more fun than my DC days this is amazing I really like this yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. So it's that interaction and the and the ability to kind of instruct and 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 direct actors, and that's probably from your just being, uh, you know, coming from that background, coming being an actor when you were a kid and all that stuff. That I don't know. I I feel like it's about it's about I, I don't know. There's this. This must be a past life thing. I don't think it has anything to do with being an actor. I don't even remember that. It's it's more about like you. I love. It's more about being a fan girl, Russ. Okay. Like, fucking love you we're gonna win this shit you and i are in this together this is what you can do to nail this thing we're gonna fight this fucking fight and then like i mean i have like kicked walls because somebody didn't want an actor cast i've like stormed out of it like i get it's it's like me and you against the world baby that's fantastic my alliance is usually never with the people that are paying my check which is not smart according to my sister i guess I guess, but you know what? That's interesting because I've I've heard this a couple of times about casting directors that, you know, they're really advocates. Like, you know, because there's as as actors, especially when you're coming up as a young kid, you're always thinking, well, you don't want to fuck up or you don't want to do this or that. But they they want you to succeed. You know, they they brought you in and they're rooting for you, and and that's a big part of what you do is this sort of you know, lifting them up and, and, and getting behind them and fighting them. Like I was saying, I was, I was uh, watching that one documentary a while back and I, rem- I just remember it's like the people that shouldn't be cast, but they were, they were fought for, you know, by the casting director. So, uh, so do you have, uh, do you have stories like that where, like you said, where you kick the walls, where you, so let, let's, let's, let's actually break it down. So for a typical casting thing, is it still, the headshots, like back in the day, I mean, you're you're casting a project, let's say an independent film. It's all coming in electronically now, I assume. But whether it was back in the day with headshots or even now electronically, what is it that you're you're keeping in mind as you're breaking this stuff down for these characters? What are you thinking about when you are going about casting? Really thinking about bringing people in? What are you looking for? What what is that? Well, I'm a I'm a weirdo. 
because I might be the only casting director left that literally has the old, I mean, I had to bring them home, the, the, the old staples filing cabinets. <laughs> and I like legit will sit there. I'm like, you know, tactile with like the stacks of headshots. Right, and right. I still do that. I miss that. And I, the right, I mean, even just like looking at the, the dumb shit that I write, like I'll meet an actor in a workshop and it's like hearts and stars and balloons <laughs> and exclamation points. And it's like, I'm a 13 year old, like writing like a guy's last name after my name because I'm in love with him. Like that kind of weird shit. Like my bet about like, just, I love this person's work. So I still use the hard copy files and yeah, everything's electronically and I schedule that way and everything. But here's the thing about the DC days, arena stage and the Shakespeare theater at the Landsberg were the only theaters that could afford someone who kind of had a name. So like back in the day, it's like Kelly McGillis would do a show or two at the Shakespeare Theater right. a year. And that was a big fucking deal. Arena would once in a while have a name. Not really, but what I'm saying is the rest of us were too broke. Right. So here's how you got popular as a casting director in DC. If you could find fresh faces that were brilliant but that hadn't already like worked at all the places and everybody knew them because they were part of the small town whatever whatever you were like a golden god hmm. well those are my formative years that's my early 20s right. so of course that stuck with me so now i still work the same way hmm. where yeah you got to do all the bullshit expect you got to do all the bullshit which is the like list making and the fucking like and the caa offers and all that stuff i hate all of it (laughs) but then if i what i love doing is being like yeah there's this person they're unrepresented i met them at a workshop i saw them do like a two-second scene and i was like you're it and then and like you won't you won't find this person because you hired a cast director who's just click, 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 click on Gersh or right, whatever. Sure. And I and I pride myself. Well, on I'll that. tell you what. I mean, that's that's super encouraging to hear because, you know, uh, just being an actor all these years, my my experience with it always was it seemed like the most. I mean, showbiz gets this this great. Um, this great uh, lauding of, of being, you know, taking risks and being out on the edge, but it's the most risk averse business in the world. And that was always my experience with casting directors and agents and managers and things was, you know, it's, I, well, I can't take a chance. I can, uh, you know, so to hear somebody who likes the talent scout part of it, you know, uh, as oh, a, I hear a story, I'm sorry to cut you off. Do I hear a story? Yeah, a little please, story? Absolutely. Because it just happened today. Oh, excellent. Um, I've done so many drugs. So I've got to get it out before I forget because <laughs> it'll right. just nag me. Okay. So, th- so today I was, I was looking at, um, Ben and I, Ben wanted to smoke some weed, my husband, before he left for the glass blowing studio. And I was like about to go on our infrared sauna blanket. So I was like, all right, we can watch Love Island for a few minutes. <laughs> there was so the- much to unpack in that sentence. Let me just <laughs> can we catalog it. Okay, go ahead. I got it. <laughs> so we, we, like, we put on the Hulu thing for a second, right? right? And uh, um, the, the image comes up for, it's like a very moody Christmas or something. Okay. That thing with Dennis Leary that came out last year. Okay. And I looked at, the woman, the young woman in the picture, and I was like, I remember, right, that's Chelsea Fry. Chelsea Fry, I met at a workshop, and I remember seeing her do a scene and being like, she's fucking awesome. And then I brought her in for, like, some cheesy-ass show I was doing for Lifetime, mm. and I remember the showrunner looking at me. Like, she got, she, he saw her on the tape, he didn't look at the resume, he just liked her, brought her in for a callback, but then he now, he now has the hard copy of the picture and resume, and he's like, can you have your assistant print this out again? Because she only has, like, a credit on here. Like, something came out wrong with the printing. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. So I had Julia go and do it again. She came back, same resume. And I was like, oh, yeah, so she has, like, no credits, wow. FYI. And he was like, and you trust her? And I was like, you're going to cast her in this. That's awesome. Like, don't fucking question it. She's super talented. Look, she's young. And even if she wasn't young, she lived a life, whatever. Just fucking cast her. I can usually smell crazy on somebody. She's not <laughs> it. Like, go for it. And he did, and she was wonderful. Wow. But neither one of us gave a shit what was on her resume. Man. Next thing you know... Because she's also such a great content creator, she's she could have been any white girl on that very moody Christmas. Then they could have gone with somebody namey, or they had was it like Dennis Leary, maybe Elizabeth Perkins in that thing? I don't remember, mm-hmm. but like it's a namier thing. It's a big deal. It's a Hulu thing, and they cast her. I was a part of at least giving her a resume. Sure. I met her at a workshop. Hmm. She didn't have a 
an agent then like fuck yeah that's the stuff that gets me off well man that's awesome that's that that is uh, so exciting to hear because it's it, it is a tough it's like i said very risk averse business there and 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 it's so easy to kind of to rest on the you know well you know there's six other guys or girls that look like this but three of them have been doing new york episodics for blah 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 so i know they're going to be okay even though you're great but I know these guys and, you know, I kind of, you know, I mean, so to see that somebody who's saying, wow, something smells good here. Let's do this. There's something I want to fight for. That's awesome. All right. So let's get into the actual technical part of the craft of it, which is um, how, uh, uh, how did it work? You can maybe compare and contrast. I don't know if it's that much different now, but how does, how do you get the jobs now? Like what? Uh, a production company or a particular director pairs with you or somebody, uh, some production hires you to cast. How does that whole process work? And then kind of walk us through like what the casting director does that you get called up. Hey, we're interested in you to be part of this, blah, 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 right through to, you know, your cast and we're ready to roll. What's, how does that work? Usually the production company. Okay. And it's usually all word of mouth. Okay. Although weirdly with original media and all my jobs there, oddly, it was like one of the SVPs of development that like looked at my Twitter, which makes no <laughs> sense because I rarely have ever tweet because as you can see, like I'm not very good with a filter thing. So I'm <laughs> deathly afraid of like saying anything I think in writing. Right. And so I don't understand, I guess the few tweets I had up there, she was like, oh, this girl sounds funny. I don't know why why but apparently it came from twitter mm. anyway pro- somebody from the production company calls i mean i guess sometimes it can it's not with tv it's usually not a director because they also sure. kind of switch up or whatever but with the film it, yeah it would be right um sometimes yeah and then okay and then basically you start with what are we dealing with money wise what are we looking for right. we, we kind of talk about the name game and what that means, what the goals are. Um, Eventually we get to the point where I get a breakdown. Right. um, You know, and hopefully I get the scripts and all the material that I need. I guess with TV there, you know, it depends. Yeah. And then the breakdown, you know, I've got to say, and I know other casting directors say different things. I think, for me at least, for the past at least five years, I don't have to fight all that hard for diversity and for women. Right. I don't really have to. And I'm not it because it's kind of being already done. Right. right. And maybe I've just lucked out in that way, but it's different than it used to be. That's Yeah, I'm sure it is. I was, that's that's a question. We go off on a tangent there that, that I want to talk about as well, which is, uh, you know, has it has it changed just the way you your mindset is when you look at a character breakdown it's like there is no you know the black officer the this the you know i mean it's like it's just sort of it could be anybody and and it never used to be that way right am i wrong or yeah i mean but like what's honestly like what's a little uncomfortable now is that it's to me again this is my projects my experience where like everyone is is i mean I, maybe i'm i just attract people that really give a shit about diversity sure. and and women and that's amazing i love that but like the i i've had to release several breakdowns that's pretty much like anything but a caucasian man yeah. and that feels a little weird yeah. to me yeah i yeah. mean i can it I just can, feels weird i can see a little bit of that happening now where I mean, it's it's just the way the pendulum swings a little bit, you know. It's uh, it's going to go that way, where you know uh, we're going to have a, a a few years of being the the muggers and the and the whatevers and the killers and the so- sociopaths and the you know. I mean, it's just you know, that's be, being the white guy is it's a different thing now than it was before, which is it is what it is. But uh, but what's interesting is that, like I said, the the ex the um, the expectation is is like leveled. Like you're, you're looking at it with a clear palette to go into it. You're not, you don't have these thoughts of, of, uh, this has to be this, this has to be that. It's just kind of like, well, why couldn't these people be these things, you know? Yes. And like, and as you can tell from my personality, like there's this like interesting fighting for actor justice thing. Right. And, you know, I still find myself fighting all the time for 
because there's that there is a lack of fairness when it comes to compensation and and all that. Like I find myself still kind of playing a weird manager role where I shouldn't. But one thing that that I don't have to fight for as much is couldn't this be a woman? Couldn't this be a person of color? Like, and I just don't have to fight for it like I used to. Was there, so there was, there was a time where that where you had to do that? Where you oh, yeah. found yourself doing that? Give me an example. I mean, you don't have to give a specific example, but I mean, just the idea of was it was it just sort of ignorance on the part like they hadn't <laughs> thought of it that way or they were you know where you had to really break through and say no you, you know you, we gotta we have to go this way i mean was i it- just remember like with one film where it was like there was one person of color and of course it's the sassy black best friend <laughs> right. and i just remember being like there's this one- oh my god it's, just, I'm, it's fucked up that i'm saying this but are you and it's always sunny fan Oh, the, oh, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. I've seen. I had never watched the whole season of it, but I've seen a bunch of them. Yeah, I like it. So I love the comedy of it. It's great. It's okay, a, so that's absurd. like my favorite show, yeah. and I've seen like all fourteen seasons or thirteen seasons right. like twenty million times. <laughs> and like, there's one episode that is so amazing and funny, and literally, they're they're basically just like, and does anyone really have a black best friend? And let's talk about that. Let's let's unpack that for a second because right. they're really talking. They're, they're making fun of multicam sitcoms sure. right. and on the show in that particular episode. And I just remember being like, you're going to have one person of color. And of course it's written this way right. and it's her like really. And so yeah, the, 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 there's certain things that I'll point out and then just say like, let's mix it up a little bit and figure out how we can do this where right. this is not the only person of color in the cast or like a situation where, you know, I mean, this is like from back in the day of like, why, why, because it's a judge or a cop or what or detective or what like why does it have to be a man right or right. you know i don't know i just like i haven't had to fight those fights in a long time because fortunately everyone just seems to where do you if think I, that, if anything they're they're scared to not just have a very very diverse well, cast but i've heard other casting directors say differently differently in what way that they still have to fight for it yeah like i've heard people on panels or whatever say that they're still saying but what about this but what about this i just i haven't I, I haven't really seen the need that I can remember any time recently. They like, it's been, everyone has been very aware. Yeah. I would say, I would say just as an outside observer, just popping on whatever screen I'm looking at from commercial to, to original content on all these different platforms. It's all, it's complete. If, if one business has done this, it's show business. <laughs> because it's, yeah. it's completely different. It's every interracial couple on a commercial is the next commercial after the next commercial or, 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 or original, you know, stuff on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon. It's all coming from that place, you know, automatically now. So I wonder, yeah, we're getting better. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, for, for sure. I think it's, I think that this is the one business that can get, that can, uh, you know, be a little proud of its, progressiveness as far as that goes so let's talk about this part of um of uh of uh diversity what's interesting about casting directors just again as a layman on the outside most of y'all are women how'd that happen it's like a lot of women in game it's that, a lot right? of yeah what 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 do you think that's about is it a i mean is it like a you're just good at it you're like you're better than than, than the i mean there's it's mostly a woman dominated industry Oh, I got a lot of theories on that. Okay, lay one on me. If you want like a darker picture of that, I have an autoimmune disease. Like you can't really tell now, but we'll see when I when I get up and walk. I kind of like hobble around a little bit. I was just like this fucking job. Like it's so stressful, <laughs> yeah. and like I don't think it helps. And I probably created this just from casting because it's like act- actors don't see that everyone is so operating out of fear and anxiety and crazy. We're all wounded birds in this industry. But then you have the ones like the ones that are above me. And so on one side, you got a bunch of people being really nice to you, like the actors that are not namely and kind of kissing your ass because they want work or just, we just like each other. They're super great. On the other side, it's like being pistol whipped 24 seven. And even if you're perfect, Mm. it's still fucking crazy. So not only are a lot of us, we have no kids, a lot of us can't even have pets. There have been some that I've met in LA that, that don't have partners. Um, there's also usually a weight issue. I just lost 110 pounds to wow. give you perspective on that. Congratulations on that. On that. Thank you. Um, I There's an autoimmune disease problem. I think that part of the reason why it's women is because we... 
we multitask, mm. which is probably not a great thing anyway, and probably one of the things that gets us sick. Right. I think that we're used to people pleasing. Sure. We're nurturing so that we're great to the producers because they feel like we're taking care of them, but the actors feel like we're taking care of them. Mm. So I don't know. I think there's a lot of like the most beautiful and the darkest side of what it is to be a woman in the world. And then especially like even up until recently, just the whole thing about like, I'm really fucking great working with some older straight man where like, Oh my God, I'll flirt with you and I'll mean it. I'll cater to your ego. I'm going to be super cool, but I'll always play like the, the, I'll always, what is, what is that saying about like for every mm strong man for every man there's a whatever behind yeah, right, him right, like right 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 strong woman i down. will be that bitch yeah <laughs> i'll be your bitch <laughs> right. so i yeah i mean I, I envy the men in this business especially the i hate to say it but the straight men who are kind of like who who for years have just kind of come in and they've been like this is the way it is mm. like da 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 and right. like they kind of come in with a completely different energy where I think a lot of the women kind of like you know come in being like I've got it no I've got it I fucking got it because <laughs> wow. then you had Jewish to the equation it's oh, even well, crazy yeah. and New York walking yeah. fucking stereotype right. New York and Jewish and, and anxiety all so that's interesting so yeah so the the whole idea of, of a nurturer and a people pleaser and a multitasker and all this stuff that naturally retribute to them, but it also creates such heavy anxiety, which affects your immune system, affects your stress levels. And, and wow, that's intense. Oh, and then also on the plus side with women too, you get the intuition part. Yes. This is one I want to get into. Um, talk about that a little bit, especially when you're, we'll get back to now, we'll weave our way back to that process where that production company's hired you, you get the breakdowns, you've gotten the script, maybe, maybe not, but you're looking at these character breakdowns and you're starting to put uh, faces and, and, and submissions to names. What is it? Is it intuition? What is it that's happening that you're seeing where you get Yeah. It? Yeah. It is like just a knowing. And I have done, again, I've pulled some weird shit. <laughs> Do you see... um? utopia on amazon i haven't seen it i've seen the, the, the plugs for it but i haven't seen it yet no so chris denham is in that d-e-n-h-a-m and i remember doing something really weird like most of my weird shit was you know a decade ago or more <laughs> um i've calmed down a bit since then uh maybe or at least i've i've, I've i don't kick walls i, I can't <laughs> my knees are so fucked up but like with chris denham i remember doing something very bizarre based on intuition. I don't even know if Chris knows this story. Uh, he will now. He will now, <laughs> yeah. He he plays Arby on Utopia. Just so when you watch it, you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay. And he's very good. And uh, he, I think, I don't think, I'd never see him, seen him in a play. He came in, and this is like before I was even putting independent film auditions on actual tape. Like I was just seeing people in the room and then I'd bring the director in for callbacks or sometimes they were there for the initials. And this is for a film called El Camino. And I remember I saw his initial audition and within a second I was like, okay, he's the character of Grey. We're good. We're done. I'm done here. Like I'm good. Wow. And so then I think what happened was he had to leave town to do a show somewhere. So he was unavailable for callbacks. And at that time, it wasn't like, oh, just put yourself on tape. Like, I don't right. think we had cameras on phones, but it was like flip phones. You could take still pictures. <laughs> right. That was it, right? And I remember I knew that he should be playing the role. And I remember Googling him and seeing like a review for him in Master Herald and the boys on Broadway, seeing a review of Red Light Winter, which he had just done an Adam Rapp play. And they were, you know, singing his praises. And I, I, I sent those to the director and I was like, if you don't cast him, and it was it was a wall kicker, right? Mm -hmm. And he was like, right. So you want me to cast him sight unseen, and you've only seen like a two minute audition, and you're like basically saying like I bet my life on this guy wow. is going to be the best thing in the film. What the fuck? <laughs> this is so irresponsible. And I was like, it's just I know, right. I just know. And I got mad and I, and like, I guess, event, I mean, I don't, I think the first time they met, he was already cast, but basically he was like, we're going to do this just because I kind of want to prove you wrong. Like, <laughs> right. 
and he cast him and like and he and he basically ended up calling and saying yeah he was the best thing in the wow. in the film like i knew it i knew that elizabeth moss was going to be high maintenance on that set i knew that <laughs> and they should have gone with the woman who was not a name who i'd met in the workshop right. and i got very angry about that but i you know i kind of understood the name thing right. i mean thank god elizabeth moss has turned into elizabeth moss now besides the scientology part <laughs> but like but but i i knew she was going to be tough sure. and that was gut Gut instinct. I so, was is right. there, so let me stop you there. So, is there any? Is there ever a time where you, where you question it, that intuition, or where you've, where you've, your intuition has led you the wrong way, or, or are you pretty much on the money with this stuff when you're casting? Do, do you go, oh man, maybe I should have looked at that third guy or whatever it is. There was one time I kind of cast with my pussy. And I wasn't <laughs> fully happy. You know, it's true. Like, and so, so there. Are, I used to play this weird game once in a while where I was like, okay, you got this fucking dumbass that you are insisting on casting and I'm totally against it. So I want one. Ah, uh, gotcha. And I would play this game with independent film directors. Like I remember doing that with this film called Buffalo Bushido and the director decided to cast himself in the lead. And I was like, okay, I think that's a terrible decision. And then he wanted to cast, like he cast this woman in the lead and she was just this LA actor. And I was like, she's going to ruin your life. <laughs> And she's going to be so vain that she's going to insist on being in like crazy hair and makeup for the role of this like Buffalo single mom. Blah, blah. I was like, she's going to fuck. She's going to be terrible. I get one. Sure. And the, I got one. It was only like it was a 50% pussy related decision. That was Fred <laughs> Weller. And that was a good idea. He's a really good actor. But the 100% pussy one was this film called Frank the Bastard. And I was mad about something. Oh, probably several things. And I was like, well, did I get the role of whatever the guy was? Sorry with the P. I don't remember. Pierce. I was like, I get that guy. I get I get who I want. <laughs> and I think like these like middle-aged male directors are just like, she's cute. Fine. Yeah, whatever. Fine. Have at it. <laughs> and I said Chris Sarandon. Wow. Because I used to masturbate to Chris Sarandon <laughs> on Fright Night. That's awesome. For years, I would just watch the dance scene over and over again with that lesbian lady and like over it, which I didn't know at the time. And, and I was just like that, like, I, I love him. Oh my it God. It has to be him. And I have to say, I did not like his performance. <laughs> well, it was, he was there for other reasons at that point. <laughs> we, I, I met him yeah. on, on set. Unfortunately, I got to bring my mother too. She was all like geeked out. I don't know why. Like, but, but like, and I remember seeing him when I saw the Mayflower Madam, he really was starring opposite Candace Bergen. And I was like, mom, I want to do that. And she was like, that's illegal. You can't be a madam. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I kind of still want right. to, but like, I was always in love with Chris Sarandon and he made me like a paper boat like that you could wear as a hat like you do like an origami thing and i still have it yeah no weird all right so all right so that i dig it so sometimes you trade off and trade on for other reasons that's that's totally cool we all do it uh (laughs) actors and directors and casting directors all right so let's get back to the uh, the process again uh which is is it different for it's got obviously different but how is it different for because you've done a lot of stuff for networks Big network television stuff, Bravo, Lifetime, all these things I saw on, on the, the stuff that, that I took a look at, to the independent production company. What what is the what's your constraint? What's your you know, does your job change? Like your interactions change, notes coming down, like do you get the same kind of things? Okay, so hit maybe on hit me on some of the differences there. Oh, it's so much more okay. political when you're dealing with network stuff and it's also weird like on one I remember going out to LA and I wanted to meet one of my bosses like the casting directors that work full-time for the network and I remember he sat down with me and he was like boy you had a shit job on that one because like you were like basically offering all these names scale I fucking like I would have run from that shit like that was just terrible and I'm thinking like uh that was also your project and you might have been able to change that and yeah it did suck and I like my whole I feel like for me and this is a one of the reasons why I wish I had stuck around and worked for like an Allison Jones type person or gone to LA or whatever because my whole career has like been one big apology which is another (laughs) reason why women probably do this because it's like all the people with all the money in the world are like we have no money at all we're totally poor and it's like fuck you and it's only going to get worse I'm sure pandemic has made it even worse like everyone cries poverty and so then you've got what they expect this is on every level they they unless you're a name they want 
everything for nothing. And also a lot of these producers and networks feel like, oh, actor, you should be paying us. Sure. You are so lucky we picked you, motherfucker. And and it's it's so I feel like every time I make an offer, I'm like kind of apologizing also because everyone just wants a discount. So, so does that, that that comes to you then? You're the one who, you know, uh, you're making the offer to the actor. Like you're yeah. you're saying, here's the numbers. This is what they're gonna. Wow, that's interesting. So are are you talking? Uh, I guess it depends on the level of the piece or what the thing is, but are you talking directly to the talent or are you talking to people's representation or what? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, unless they don't have representation and then I'm right. talking directly to them. Right, and then um, you're saying, yeah, they, yeah we, got, uh, we got scale on this one. So, and it's, wow. So you're the one who has to make that, uh, I didn't know that. I didn't know how that's how, how it all played out. Interesting. Casting director's got to do it. <laughs> it sucks. Yeah. What was the one uh, that uh, all that was it? I looked on the thing. Did you you did um, oh, what the fuck was it? Shark Sharknado or one of those crazy uh, things where everybody's on for uh, you know two minutes and all former names and stuff. That's got to be a strange thing to cast. I only did the some of the New York roles because okay. it was shot here, but they cast um, most of it. Like our, it was right. like the second one, I think. So they already had right. you know all those people. That was probably one of the weirdest, especially with all the acid I've dropped, like in the 90s. And uh, it was one of the weirdest experiences I've ever been through. It was also disappointing because Mike Fenton was like the the LA, the the big casting director on it. And so this is a guy who is fucking Mike Fenton. And so I was like, hi. You know, I was like totally geeked out. I was freaked out you know just talking to him and i was like my heart would race every time we would talk on the phone but it was like oh my god but this though with him, <laughs> right. this right and what was so crazy about that one is i'm pretty sure that the director and the production company and the producers or whatever they all thought they were doing schindler's list like i kept going like are you fucking with me but no i don't think they were like I, I don't know if they understood what it actually was like i'm still like so deeply unclear on that because there was a lot of yelling there was a lot of like fighting for the ta- like the talented actors and they don't wow. see what i want blah, blah, blah. there was like a lot of craziness and i was like wait what like what what's that what but yeah no they took it very very fucking serious wow that's interesting well I, I guess that first one was such a surprise they thought man we got some money to make here maybe we could turn it into something who knows but that's what an interesting thing so um so you, you mentioned mike fenton were there other in your industry did you have like heroes do you have people where you're like oh man that's a what a great office so that's a great that this person really knows you know and do you envy, like, do you, did you ever want to have the relationship like, um, you know, some of these directors like Woody Allen's got Juliet Taylor and, and Scorsese's got, uh, what's her name, you know, where, the, where it's the same, they're, they're kind of paired together. Did you ever have that kind of relationship? Are there, are there casting directors you look to where you're like, that's cool. I'd like to do that. If I were, if I were not like really just thinking more and more about doing what I love all the time, which is the coaching, sure. the performance coaching thing, right? Like if I wasn't 47 and being like, like it, uh, first of all, I'd probably move to like Atlanta or somewhere like that. Right. You know, I, the, there's like, there's other choices I would make where I'd move to LA. If I wasn't at this place in my life where I'm like, how much do I really, really want to invest in this? But what I would love, I mean, oh my God. And I don't know if we'd get along personally, cause I've never met these people, but like Allison Jones, like Jeannie McCarthy, mm. You know, uh, there there are people that that they hire the same people to do these comedy things that right, I love. Right. So I don't have a director necessarily. I've, I've never been I've never geeked down on directors ever, which is one of the reasons why I don't give a shit about Oscar films right. and stuff like but that. But it's the genre that you you didn't get to get into that you wanted to do. I mean, like, oh my god, if I could like be like like the bitch, like, like, you know, Rob McElhenney, Rob, Rob McElhenney and Charlie Day's bitch on It's Always Sunny, where it's like, they've got the main cast, but like, I get to cast these right, weird right, random guest right. star and co-star roles or whatever. Cause what I did, what happened was I got in the casting way before 2008 mm. and all of a sudden this Judd Apatow came into play and right. it was like, this is the era of bromance. We're going to take a bunch of like hairy, schlubby Jewish guys right. and give them all these hot shiksas and make them like leading men right. and like the cool funny thing or whatever. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, 
I've found my thing. And like all the things I love are the same. The league, it's always sunny. Um, even with with, car, with with uh with animation, it's like it's yeah, South oh, yeah, Park, it's absolutely. Family Guy. It's it's, like it's, all that shit. it's absurdist and it's and it's all pushing against the establishment, you know, vi- you know, real poking fun at, at 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 the at the slick, you know. That's what it's all yeah. about. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So before we get into the coaching part, one last little bit on the casting bit. So as actors in, uh, when I came up through the, you know, late nineties and two thousands and stuff. And, uh, you know, we all did the showcases and stuff, the one-on-one and, uh, actors connection. And there was a couple of other ones. And I, I, I know they had that in LA for a while, but then that got fucked up. Somebody did some weird shit out there. So they don't have that kind of stuff. But do you, did you do that? Did you go to plays? Did you go like, how did you go scout talent and how do casting directors in general do it? Um, even opposed to you. I mean, how do you, did you go find this stuff? Did you do all those showcase things or what? Well, in terms of actual, like, let's say equity showcase contracts, like off, off Broadway plays is sure. what I'm saying. When I was in my twenties and early thirties, I would go to five a week. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then I did a lot, I would go to a lot of improv stuff before I think my health started really taking a turn and my mom got cancer and everything. So I would say up until like where I stopped seeing theater as much, it was probably, a, it was probably eight, nine years ago, okay. I guess like where I would go, but just, I was very selective about what I went to, but also. So just, I've, so let me stop you right there. So for, so you're working, right? You got your work day, you're in the casting office, you're doing whatever you're doing. Then at night you got to go out and watch shows. Oh, wow. That's crazy. But it's changed. Okay. And I think that, like, and when, I think when everything started changing, well, that kind of worked really well for me. So I started changing, too, and just became exhausting, especially here in New York. So all of a sudden, it wasn't about, like, if you really want to see more of this actor's work. Like, let's say I met them in a seminar at Actors Connection, and they're like, come see me in my play. In the earlier part of my career, it was always like an absolutely. Then it got to the point where I was like, when I really so trusted my gut, Mm. that I was like, I don't need to, because I already love you and you're going to need to trust in, in, in our relationship, but I don't need to be told twice that you're awesome. I already know. Now, if the rest of the ensemble is great and the play is great, cool. But I don't need to just see you being awesome again. And I know you're insecure about that, but you got to trust me. Gotcha. This is how we're going to build a relationship. Because boy, you know what really made me angry was I would meet an actor at a workshop. So yes, I would do that stuff too. Just, then, just let me stop you right there. Just, uh, just remember your thought. Uh, just so people know, uh, in New York, there are things like um, they're sort of pay for play kind of showcase things where actors pay their thirty five or forty bucks or whatever on a Monday night or a Tuesday night, and certain casting directors or agents or or, or managers or whoever are there. And yeah. You do a little bit for them. You do kind of five minutes with them or whatever. And, and there's a couple of different versions of that that you guys sat in on. So that's where you'd beat these actors. So you'd go to these things and. Yeah. And so I would meet an actor, fall in love with them. They Then they would follow up a week later and be like, I'm doing this play, blah, blah, blah. And, like, and, and for a, many years, I was like, yeah, oh, my God. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I would go. And then I would get angry mm. a lot of the time because it was like they weren't. And this is like one of the biggest pieces of advice I could give to actors is like, you will form such a strong bond when you see the casting director as much as they see you. So I would do this Q and A and I'm like the same person we're to, you're talking to now. And I would talk about my taste and I would be like, it's so it's the fucking hangover movie over and over and over again in different forms of the league or whatever. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. And all the, and I'm not saying it's everybody, but for a lot of actors, it was like, come to my play, come to my play, come to my play. And I remember this one actor only one time uninvited me to something. She was doing an all female production of Romeo and Juliet. She was playing Mercutio and she, she called me and said, your tickets are no longer at the box office. It's three and a half hours long. You're going to hate this. I'm not feeling it for you. And I fought her because it was like back when I was still seeing everything. And I was like, but I want to watch you play Mercutio. And she's like, I'll just tell you about it wow. sometime over a beer. We're good. You're not coming. You have the night off. What a gift. 
because I would find myself like even with dear friends, I'm like, I cannot believe I am watching this piece of shit. <laughs> it's a lot in of shit. <laughs> pity, moldy black box. Right. You fucking know, you don't know that this is a shit play. You don't know that everyone around you sucks. And yeah, you're good. Right. But I already knew you were good, bitch. Right, right, right. And so that I got burned sure. so many times. Right. But see, now the fun part is that everyone has content online right. or they have, you know, reels or clips or sure. whatever. And so we don't have to go to all these shows like we used to, right. except with, um, well, of course it's the same thing actually with that too. But I was going to say like, there was something about going to see improv or sketch that was like magical to be there in person right, also. Right. But even with that, they figured out a way around it. I'm <laughs> so, so proud of actors and I'm so proud of our industry that they now are like, I mean, you and I know we come from a time of like, stay in your lane. <laughs> right. And now they're like, Oh, you want to write it, direct it, show run it and star in it. Fucking great. We don't have to do anything. Right. Right. Well, I mean, that was my experience as a young act when I was, when I was a kid, you know, my 20, I was doing a lot of theater and stuff. And I actually, I worked with, <laughs> I worked with a guy who was, he was Donald Trump's brother-in-law. I don't know if he still is. He was in the same office that I worked in as a manager of a building that I was working in. And he's like, you know, I know Don Buckwald personally, big agent in New York. And he's like, I'm going to get you in to see this guy. And I'm like, like the Don Buckwald? Yeah, the Don Buckwald. That's and I'm weird. Like, I'm like, what the fuck? Because he'd seen a couple of shows. So I get in, I get a meeting with one of his, obviously it's not Don Buckwald. It's his top, what legit agent. Before my ass hit the seat, she says, this has got to be like 1995 or 94 or something. She says, okay, uh, just so you know, we're, you're, we're not signing you. Okay, it's before you even sit down. So it's, you got in here. That's good. You knew somebody, you got in here. Let's talk about this and that. And, and we proceeded to have this great conversation where she said, and this is back then. She said, you know what you got to do? Go out and do your own thing. Create your own content, write your own content, direct your own content. And I, and I was like, okay. You know, and I was working a lot of, doing a lot of theater at the time. And I ended up for the next however many years of my life producing films and directing my own stuff and doing, doing all my own stuff, being a, a director in a theater company and running a theater company, all this kind of shit for 15 years. And I never really went out and pounded the pavement. You know, most of the stuff that I've done has been through me or produced by me or in conjunction with other people. And then I went out later on in my 40s, I guess, back to do those one-on-ones, which I had done when I was 20. And I started doing, I was doing like 10, 15 of these things, you know, plunking down the cash and doing these acts and meeting all you guys, right? And without question, <laughs> what I got back was, man, you're amazing. Where have you been? And it's like, well, I've been doing this, that, and the other. This is what this person told me all these many years ago. Do your thing. And I did that. And, and now, wow, that's fantastic. You should be on every New York episodic, blah, 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 blah. But guess what? All the guys that are that look like you have already been that guy and have been that guy for 10 years on, the, on, on that stuff. So you're almost like a new face, but an old guy. We don't know what to do with you. So it was this catch-22 where it's like, but this chick told me, you know, 20 years ago, do it. And I my, spent my whole career creating a whole career. And that, and then you, you went out to these showcases and they were like, yeah, you, that was the right thing to do, but it's a, it, now it's a different way to, so it's, it would, it was almost impossible to go out and pound the pavement as an actor later on than it was then. But even back then is my point from that long story is my point was, and it's so much more relevant now is create your own career. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no excuse as to why, particularly with the price point of technology and, and all that stuff, that you can't go out and make your own films and create your own theater and the venue. Just the fact that I can do this and get this stuff out there to the world in, in, in half a second, you couldn't do that in 1995 or whatever it was. So I think it's an advantage for actors. And for someone like you, uh, the way we started this conversation, who <laughs> during COVID... Is, has found a nice little pocket to be able to stay inside. You don't have to go out and touch those people anymore. You don't have to go to those showcases anymore. You just press the button and their work appears on your screen. And, uh, you know, I, I guess it's good. I, I still think we need that human contact. And I, I guess eventually we'll get back around to it. But um, for what you do, is there a difference? Like, you watch an actor's reel online casting is it a different is it as different as as what an audience member would feel watching it in in the theater as to seeing it on i mean are you still getting the gut instinct 
that you would get you get the same thing as you would with that person sitting in actors a one-on-one showcase you know like do you get the uh the gut instinct i think is is uh it, it, i think i think there's just more of a visceral like holy fucking motherfucking shit like there's more of that when you're actually with someone when you're in sitting with person. them right yeah yeah because you said before you can smell crazy <laughs> there's also that yeah can you smell that on in the world we're in now good question good question well i'm really lucky to have this guy in la i got a guy for like for virtual callbacks and okay. so it's like a fancy zoom situation mm. so you get a little bit of the but yeah no it's not like because also in the um if you're in the room you can really figure it out on another level yeah well that's what i i mean i gave you this roundabout crazy story just to get to the idea of the fact that technology has made things so much better in so many ways but your particular job is so like that person something about that person and is that electricity the same this way like on this screen as if unless you were sitting right here with me you know is it the same i don't i i don't know i feel like it might be deeper in person but i do have to say like i was just um i just did a a workshop it was like a one night seminar thing stone street nyu brought mm. me in it was you know all on zoom and uh there were two guys in that class and i was just like <laughs> like i just freaked out right. like i just I, you know and it was the same thing of just like you 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 like you can still figure out who the stars are it, it, and i don't i don't know if this just goes along with like you know having ovaries or whatever <laughs> like i i have no idea but i have to say I feel like, I mean, Malcolm Gladwell, like, when that book is sitting right here, like, he wrote Blink. Like, I feel like uh, even just to survive, we all have that gut instinct right. about people. Just some people have their heads up their own asses more and, like, miss things. And right. and I don't. And, by the way, another reason why I don't miss, and this is this is dark. Um, did you ever see Lie to Me? Uh, I don't think so. Tim Roth on Fox? Oh, yes, yeah. Where he, where he can, he's got a certain psychic almost ability that he can, yeah, okay, right. Yeah, I remember it. Well, so for him, his, and he, it's based on a real guy a real therapist or something, or something. Or other. Yeah, right. For him, it's the science of microexpression. Right. So he would say that, I think he would say, I don't, it, it, I just can see it. And then if we slow the tape down, you, it's the same microexpressions for like lying or this right. or that or shame or guilt or like for whatever, for everybody, I can just, I can see it. Right. There's one woman who works in the office, and I remember this from the pilot episode, and he's like, you're a natural. And she doesn't really understand. I don't even know if she buys into the science. and She's fascinated by it, but she immediately knows. Mm. And he said, I'll tell you why you're like that, like why you're a natural. When, you're, when you come from such a fucked up home where you, you always have to be able to read people that are totally erratic or – it's unsafe for you in whatever way, emotionally, right. physically, whatever. You learn how to navigate social situations and 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 always be able to suss out where somebody is in any given moment. Um, and then then you can take it a step further and you can make them happy. Mm. You can like you you can can you're you're so hyper aware because right. that's how you got through childhood. Right. So is that uh, is that you? Oh you? yeah, like like <laughs> yes, and and was, when one of your parents is an alcoholic and the other one is like you know not that fond of you, you and is also a little crazy. Like you learn very quickly did you have how si- to like did you figure have, it all out. Did you have siblings as well or no? Yeah, um, Meredith's also Meredith is the relationship columnist for the Boston Globe. My sister, she's amazing, and she is my my husband is one of my persons. She's <laughs> the other person, and. If we're not watched carefully, well, Grey gardens it up. Like, we're scary <laughs> together. We're, like, inseparable. And, she, and Meredith is good at reading people. Also came from the same home. But, like, it was just more solid with her and my mother. But very not good with her and my father. And, you know, I feel like, you know, we're really good at... We're, yeah, we're, we, it's like you have to do it. Okay, oh, so this is what I was saying. So there, there's that, right? And I think that that's also a reason why... A, a lot of the casting directors have the same personality. Right. There's like a lot of me mm-hmm. in the game. Gotcha. And I do feel like we probably come from, fu- most of us in the t- business come from fucked up homes anyway, right? Yeah. Um, I remember one day I played a game with my friend's kid, who at the time was six. And I said, 
because actors often ask me, like, I get it if you know an actor, but if you don't know an actor, how do you prep? Are you strictly going off of their credits? Because you don't seem to be all that resume driven. It's one of the reasons why you got out of theater. So like, what's your thing? And my thing is gut instinct. Mm. And we're talking about from a thumbnail. So like, even when I choose sides for actors for like seminars and I've never met them before, it's literally a two second process. I look at them like that would be the perfect thing. And I can't tell you, it's like almost every time they're like this hit so close to home, almost too close to home. I just know. So, and that's why I'm doing this coaching thing. Cause it's like, I just want to make a career out of it. If my gut feeling is that good, right. there it is. Um, Kate says I'm psychic. I don't know about that. I don't, I don't, I think it's just like a, it's a, an intuition. Anyway, this six year old and I, I don't really know how to deal with kids. So I said, sit next to me. Her mom was out grocery shopping or something. I said, come sit next to me. I have to cast a six year old for this film that I'm doing you pick out the actors I should call in. I want to see who you pick out. I don't even know if this girl could read. Right. She's six. I don't know. And it wouldn't have mattered if she could read. She would have what's in Abrams. Shh, she right. wouldn't know what that is. Right. She's pointing to the people, her, 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 scrolling up. And I swear to God, Russ, same choices. Like, wow. I would have picked the same kids. Wow. Yeah. And I think, you just know when you even look at a picture, you're like, all right. So let's, so it comes from, uh, it comes from building intuition through regular trauma of being a, a kid in a certain life. It's also something that's uh, innate in you. If we want to believe our friend Kate, you are, you're tapped into, you know, some psychic thing. We'll do some mushrooms later and figure that out. <laughs> but let's now segue. Let's take that. So you, you've, you've had a tremendous career as a casting director. I assume you're still doing that and still going strong, but this special sauce you talk about, okay, this is where we're going now. You're, you're now taking what you're, what you've applied to what you've told actors all this time and you're bringing it out to the, the civilian world. Uh, what's that about? What's the whole personal coaching thing? And what are you trying to help people find, what is the special sauce? Explain explain what you're doing now. I have a question for you. Sure. Is it just me because there's an awareness around this because of this thing that I'm branching into? Or is it a thing? You know how like when everything becomes part of a collective unconscious yes. and all of a sudden you start like hearing a thing more? Like why does every Brit, I said this because of the Love Island problem, go like in it? Like, yeah, like right. it's, it's like an expression or whatever right. and all of a sudden everybody's doing it. Sure. Have you noticed, because we're probably around the same age, that like the words authenticity and vulnerability, like we didn't really, we knew what those words meant in English, but we didn't really use them a lot until like the past two, two years, three years. Would you agree? Yeah, I would say that. I would say that. Sure. There's the, you know, what do they call it? The zeitgeist. There's a sort of a, an underlying thing. And I think those particular terms probably come from, um, the fact that m- most of everybody's social interaction now is through there's a screen in between you and that other human being. There's no live theater with you and I sitting there in the room. So that has an inherent inauthenticity. So you're searching for mm. authenticity. You're searching for this special thing that, as wonderful as this is, isn't the same as if you were two feet away from me. And I think that's maybe what people are looking for is... We're, we're, we're a social species. There's just no way around it. And, uh, I mean, the worst thing you can do to a human being is put them in, in, in solitary confinement, you know? Uh, so this is, a, this is a form of that. So it, it may seem like we're all more connected and in a way we are, but in a very real way, we're not. And I think we want that authenticity. So maybe that's where it is. And part of being authentic is pulling away the heroic, you know, facade and being vulnerable so maybe that's where those two terms come from but i think it's a it's probably a function of the world this technological world we're living in right now yeah because even before pandemic it was like i think that's one of the reasons why like Brene brown her rise to success it's like she she was basically like 
look, fucking get up there and just tell me your real story because it's what's going to be. I mean, honestly, like fucking look, that's what people think about Trump, right? Yeah. They love him because he tells it like it is. Yeah. What they don't realize is they were conned by, you know, a, a complete facade. It's like the ultimate reality show. I mean, right. The, 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 the irony of the reality show is it is far from real as possible. Once you put a camera in the room, it's not real anymore, you know? So that's the, that's the con. So what, what? is, so let's get back to you. So what is it, what is it that you're, that you're looking to pull from these people and give to them? What is the, what is this thing you're doing now? So I think that it, there's so much fear, especially that goes into communication, whether it's a Zoom thing, whether it's public speaking, and especially public speaking, or even this form of public mm-hmm. speaking, where they think, like actors think when they're coming into audition for a role, that there is like a right way and a wrong way. And mm-hmm. so they're striving to do it right. And that's going to fuck up not only if you're acting, because here's the deal. This is my theory and I'm sticking to it. If with, with acting, if it's, unless it's something a little bit stylized or very stylized or a biopic or a period piece, I want you to make the character your bitch. And I want to hear the character through your voice, your eyes, your defense mechanisms. I want to hear you. Because our audiences are smart and they just want naturalism going back to the authenticity and true vulnerability shit. You're a 24 year old white girl. You can cry big fucking guy. I don't give a (laughs) shit. Like if that's not you in a given set of circumstances, I'll smell the lack of truth there. And so with the civilians, I think that they're like HR rules the day now, but before that it was putting on a corporate mask when actually like people just want to see human beings. And also if you don't know what it is about you, that's like fun and shiny and maybe the thing that should pop as opposed to like nailing the PowerPoint presentation and what reading slides or whatever it is. Like I want, I want to make, I want to reflect back. This is what I, this is what I'm hearing. This is what I'm seeing when I'm looking at you. This is what, what about you is, fucking awesome and makes you the thing that we know and love and yet a variation on a theme in a magical way and we'll take it from there because i'm going to keep bringing you back to your story your truth your perspective because that's that authenticity and the vulnerability that everyone wants i noticed when i was working with this pharmaceutical corporation that this big senior vice president guy like really didn't want to tell stories about his youth like beautiful stories but he was like i can tell you that but i can't tell it wasn't like these aren't like my uncle raped me these are like right. like real like literally sure. stories right. but he felt like nobody wants to hear about my shit and i was like are you kidding that's like the best part of anything you told me all day right is hearing well, the lesson from that i'll tell story. you we, we call, i call this podcast the art craft truth for a reason because you know i always believe that art through craft reveals truth. That's how it works. It's those three things. So you, you, art is out there and you, you use it, whatever craft you're doing to reveal truth to an audience. And the truth, like you said, the audience can smell it. If it's inauthentic, you know, you've rehearsed this thing to death and, and something goes wrong on stage. If you don't address it, if you don't deal with it, it's inauthentic and, and not truthful and the audience knows it. So what you're doing, which is awesome in your own craft there, is you're helping find that authenticity, that truth in the actual person and bringing it out. So two things. One, how does that manifest? Like how, what's the mechanism by which you do that? And two, to go back to something we talked about earlier in the times we're in now, is it dangerous? Is it when someone, you know, when someone's truth may not fit the woke world that's out there Ah. you know what what is you know those two things so how do you do it what is your kind of approach to you know getting them to see that and getting to them to express it and then two are you aware of this greater societal thing about do we really want to know what your truth is you know so hit me with that well so far at least if i'm working on like a corporate level Everyone is so goddamn terrified. I know. That's what I'm thinking. (laughs) Yeah. So if there's some dark, we all have our own weird dark truths and also the stuff that like, we're we're like, you know, we're all of a sudden we have to wrap our brains around a thing. It's not necessarily a, a, a bad thing or a great thing or whatever. Like, it's just a thing of like, you better mind somebody's pronouns now, motherfucker. Like, it's like, but that was not something we dealt with before. Like not for the majority of our adult lives, you and I. 
Um, and now all of a sudden we're learning things. And I feel like I haven't dealt yet with, okay, we need to like keep that authentic truth in the, in the closet. Mm-hmm. Because it, usually, especially on the corporate level, the civilians will walk in being like, I'm afraid to say anything right. at all, right. ever. And I understand that. So, you know, at least I can come from a place of empathy and say, well, let's break that down. And it, it always also has to do with each individual and what they need. There's somebody I worked with who really, she was like the, the last nail in the coffin. Oh, that's a terrible dog way of saying <laughs> it. But she was like the one, the confirmation for me. that This is what I wanted to do for the rest sure. of my life. And again, going with gut, I was like, okay, here's the deal. And we got into some really serious shit about her career, about even her marriage. Like it was, it, it moved in a direction of, it's time for you to do what you really want to do mm. in like all of these areas, because part of finding your voice is also taking those right. actions and, or you're going to feel like you're in solitary confinement right, because, right. you know, things and, and, and then to be able to empower somebody like, this is why that's going to work. This is my vision for you. You have the same vision, but you're, you're too afraid to express it let's talk about how to put that into action, which kind of like leans a little bit more into life coaching, but sometimes things go there. Other times, I mean, oh my God, there was one woman I worked with on a corporate level and this was fascinating to me because like, like I said, I lost a lot of weight. And so being like the fat, funny girl, to me, that's like, a, that's an archetype, right? Yeah, right? Like we know what that is. Absolutely. I was always like the fat, funny best friend. And this girl was, was kind of fat and funny. And I didn't say fat funny girl when I was talking to her. I was just like, oh my God, you're fucking hilarious. And like, I moved, we moved on to something else, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden she was like, wait. And we, we had to go back and she said, no, I'm not the funny one. My husband's the funny one. I mean, she's saying this completely. And I was like, wait, oh, I don't know your husband. And uh, you can't both be funny because my <laughs> husband and I are both funny people. And she said, no one's ever told me I was funny. And I'm thinking, really? Because like even type wise. Right, right, right. Really? Turns out, No. So she said, am I really funny? Really? And this is a woman in her 40s. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're hilarious. Let me point out why. Got it. And she was in tears. Mm. And everything changed. So it's, it's this gut level intuition that you've, you've taken from a career in, in, in casting and also just who you are uh, naturally that you find the kernel of what their truth is that maybe they don't even see and help them pull it out through just sort of conversation. And by the way, is this something that, um, I mean, you're doing this for, for, like we said, civilians, is it for, do you do groups? Like, is it companies? Is it one-on-ones? Is it individual? You know, how do you, is it, and it's just talking, is there workshoppy type stuff? Like, how do you do this? There's both. Um, Yeah, I just, today I just launched this website. It's brettgoldstein.com, now splits off in two directions. So one of the buttons you get on the landing page is for Brett Goldstein Casting, and the other one is for the performance coaching, and I think stays Brett Goldstein. And there's all these group workshops, and there's these fabulous flippy boxes that my amazing designer figured out. And those are, so I do teach group workshops, and then I do the one-on-one coaching as well. So I've done both now. And they're both wonderful for me. I love them both. So, for example, with the woman I was just talking about, that was a one-on-one. Right. And then I've done workshops, but then I've also done one-on-ones, like we're talking about that pharmaceutical company where they hire me to coach the presenters for their national sales meetings. Okay. And so I get those people one-on-one, and it's never enough time. Mm. But with them, you know, they've got uh, – it's – it's talking about a medicine. I love these guys, by the way, because, you know, I'm also on a lot of drugs for my health stuff. <laughs> I love this company. Right. Um, I love them because I they really give a shit yeah. about their patients and, like, not killing them and, That's good. and you That's know, good whatever, know. and making sure they can afford the medication. And a lot of what they have to present is, like, who gives a shit? It's, like, really medical. It's really boring. Um, or, or it's money-related right. stuff. It's a fucking national sales meeting. And they, what is their goal? Like their objective is to just get the audience to pay attention because right. they're actually up there doing it for a reason and each of their reasons is different. And so we find whether it's in, it, it's the writing of it and the delivery, 
what's going to work for each individual person to make sure that they're comfortable doing the presentations. I think it's even probably even harder. I mean, I guess if you're psyched out by like seeing 500 people in a room, that's tough. And we work on that too. But even now to watch people on zoom, Mm. like it's a total different thing. Yeah. And it's, and it's also a different kind of terror. Like when, if I'll do a Q and a before a class or something and everyone's on mute, I don't get the laughter. I don't get the, the energy and everyone's just kind of sitting there and, you know, so so there's that too. There's how to do it in a virtual so world they have, and like so, keep people there. So in each of these situations, whether it's one on one or whether it's a group, they have a goal. They have a specific end goal they're trying to do. Maybe the the individual person needs to make a presentation, or maybe they just need to break out of either not effective in whatever and in, in how they're presenting themselves at work. They want to move up the ladder, whatever it is. Or if it's a group, they got a whole bunch of people. That, so there's different. Um, end games to these things, but your process is basically the same, right? Where you're, you're just trying to find the truth in it. Yeah. Sometimes though, it's, I feel lost. I feel, I feel like maybe something needs to shift in my life, but I don't even know where to start with that. And one of, one of the things I think that, that, I don't know. I think it's great that I had 22 years of casting behind me because it's like, well, here's the thing about you that really pops. Like, this is what I do. This is how you make me feel. This is how, when you walk into a room, this is like what comes with you and you being in that room. This is what you bring to the equation. This is why I want to watch you do whatever. And then all of a sudden a conversation can come out of that because they know it somewhere deep in their souls. It's hard for them to receive it sometimes. And it's, and they're excited by it because often people think they're dull as fuck <laughs> right. or, or like or replaceable or whatever. Mm. Like, like I'm not enough for whatever reason. Well, no, this is why you're enough. And in fact, mm. this is why you're fucking great. And even the things I'm jealous about you mm. for, like, this is the thing. Okay, cool. Like I'm very drawn to like strong feminine because I tend to, feel very masculine in a lot of ways so like there I, I don't know i i there's this like like that that goddess like quiet feminine strength that mm. i'm always like ooh, let me right. this is amazing let me tell you why you're a leading lady and and coming from even like a, a entertainment industry background or like even be able to talk in archetypes so like we kind of start there and from there we can really help we, we can go through a process of making discoveries so they can figure out what the next step is and why they feel this spielkis, as mm-hmm. my mother would have mm-hmm. said. Right, like, right. why do I feel like something's off? And what, well, because your talents and your strengths are actually, we're not focusing on that in your life right now. Let's do it. Right. And what does that do for you when those things happen and they really, something clicks and you see it? What does that do for you? Oh, this is going to sound super dark, but take this in the best way. I think, like, I could die now. It's really <laughs> weird. I feel like that's it. I'm good. Like, this is the thing. This right. Doing this thing might be why I'm here on this earth. How cool is that? How cool is that to have found, to found that uh, bit of energy in your life? That's pretty fucking amazing, man. Thank you. All right, so I'm, I'm, we're going to wrap it up here a little bit, but um, two things. One, you're, you, you're obviously still... A casting director and a very successful yeah. one. So, uh, anything uh, coming up that you're excited about that you might be working on, or things coming down the pipeline that you're looking at, or anything like that you want to, without giving away people's projects or whatever, what I, that you're that might be fun for you. Anything like that? Um, I'm working on three independent films right now. Oh, cool! Very cool. Am I excited about the <laughs> scripts? <laughs> No. Do I hate them? No. Is it my cup of tea? No. But often indie film is never going to be my cup of tea. You know my taste. So clearly not romantic comedies. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, like, actually, rom-coms I'm actually not a fan of, interestingly. It's like, it's It's, it's boys. I love boys. Okay, I got you. All right. Um, it, which of course now is not in vogue, right? No, so like, so I'm, I'm going to be missing out on the, I mean, Tag got released in 2018. Did you see Tag? No, no, I didn't. Oh, it's fucking great. Yeah. And I just remember thinking no one's going to see this right. well, because no one wants to see a bunch of guys, like a bunch of white guys in Hannibal Burris run around and like play no. a very rich boys game of tag <laughs> right. and like fuck with each other. No one wants to watch Jeremy Renner fuck with John Hamm. <laughs> right. I do. So yeah. 
so so no these films like one about is a girl and her horse the other one is like <laughs> cyber security the other one is like fucking wild but like the girl is with her dad hmm. i don't know whatever what i am excited about though is uh the slowness of working on a film mm. but like the speed the collaboration i like love talking to these directors even just the way that they talk it's quiet it's slow it's grounded it's going to move me from my sympathetic to my parasympathetic yes. nervous system it's going to take me out of fight or flight and what i've been doing all pandemic because it's like the only thing that's kind of happening besides the development stuff on this film in my life is commercials mm. and that's different pace altogether <laughs> yeah. we're, now we're pistol whipping again right, right? right however right. one pistol whips so and that's been i mean thank god right i'm putting food on the table sure. but fuck yeah that's tough so i'm really excited about like even just the like really feeling like an artist again right. that's awesome all right so that that's coming up you got that stuff going on you got the coaching going on so last thing as as we wrap up this uh this great conversation i've loved every second of it um is you know for that for that civilian or for that actor who's waiting in the hallway to go in to do their presentation or go in to meet the director and casting director who's terrified and who's all the people you're trying to help, the people in show business and the people in the world world that you're trying to explain, bring the good, bring what it is that you are. What is that one bit of advice that you give them sitting out there in that plastic chair in the hallway waiting to come in with their sides or waiting to go into their pharmaceutical presentation what is that one kernel of thing to say hey we're here for you i would say no in your gut that not only are you enough there's something and probably many things about you that make us want to watch you on our televisions, want you sitting on our couch with a glass of wine, schmoozing in our living room when we're not all freaked out about COVID anymore, that want to connect to you. Very specific reasons of why you're a motherfucking unicorn. And, and, and so know that in your heart. And, and maybe you could even play a game where, where you tell each other in the game what it is about them that pop. I used to do that before everything was very politically correct. Mm. I would have like a game that was called like what makes me fuckable, which is terrible. But like but, but at the time it seemed fine. It works for me. And like, but it would quickly go away from like, you got, you know, hot lips or, or a nice ass or whatever. And move into like the things about you that made you beautiful intrinsically and marketable. Right. Everybody has that. So I would say that I would also say that we are all like very scared children on some level. So one of the greatest gifts is for you to see us and and just to be present with someone and truly listen and know in some way that you are a solution or can provide a solution to whatever's going on for them. Like with actors, like you're our peer. Right. And you the actors that are my favorite are the ones that are like, hey babe, how you doing? What do you need? I've got your back, bitch. Mm. And even if they don't say that verbally, it's the the energy around them, which is so different than like, I'm wasting your time or I'm going to blow this or like, look, there's all these people that look like me in the waiting room and they're all hotter. You, for every single person, you have so much worth in this world and you're shiny in your own individual way and no one is exactly like you and if you're like a lot of people in certain ways that's good that's why fast food restaurants happen like we, we want to know what you are but then there's that special sauce about you that makes you a little different and it, it, and know that that's there and you are enough and when you're present for us we will be present for you and that's like the real gift that's awesome. Well, I I, uh, I think you're uh, you're well on the way to helping people uh, find that attunement in the room. You know, find that 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 presence and attunement with the other piece person in the room and connect, and um, and that's and that unique quality that we all have. Uh, you've made a career out of bringing it out in, in people, and I, and I see that you're taking it to the next level now. So, uh, I'm I'm very excited for you. I can't wait to see uh, how it all plays out and. Um, I appreciate you giving me all this time. This was a really awesome to have this much time to talk about this kind of stuff. It's a it's a part of the industry I, I never really 
got to see behind the curtain of so it's really fascinating to see and your energy is just crazy out of this world great so uh thanks so much for for being on on board today thank you russ this is fun Awesome. You're a fantastic interviewer, by the way. This was so much fun. You're great. Oh, good. I'm, well, I have a blast. I love doing these. So this is this is this is as much fun for me as it is to do it as anything else. So I appreciate Yay! it. 